So my name is Zanny. I'm a senior research fellow working in NINDS. So today I will talk about the cortical anatomy and the clinical neurophysiology for the uh, TMS introduction. As we know, TMS, the transcranial magnetic stimulation, is a powerful uh, but non-invasive technique to stimulate the uh, human brain. And uh, it's a very good technique to study the human brain function. So as we can see from this slide that if we give a stimulation to the human brain, it produces a descending body in the spinal cord. And then it can activate the spinal motor neuron pool. Uh, in transmission, it can activate the target muscle. Then we can record the response in the target muscle. So in this talk, I want to focus on four different topics. First one, how can we record the uh, response from the, mo uh, from the stimulation of TMS? Second, how can we test the spinal cord activity? The third one, uh, how do we do the motor cortical stimulation with TMS? And what is the descending body? of the TMS. And the fourth one, uh, I want to focus on the stimulation uh, outside of motor cortex. So let's go to the first part. Uh, how do we record the response of TMS? There are, uh, usually there are two different uh, techniques. One is the electroencephalography, EEG. And there's another technique named electromyography, EMG. Uh, EEG uh, is a very good technique to record uh, the activity, activity of brain. So it's usually recorded in a system named the 1020 uh, EEG system. Here, 1020 refers to the fact that the actual distance between the adjacent electrodes are either 10% or 20% of the total frontal to back or left to right distance of the skull. Here, uh, we measure the, the distance between the left ear and to right ear. Also, we measure the distance from na nasing point to the evening point as the total difference. Uh, we can um, mount many electrodes on the uh, scalp. Here, we use the abbreviation of F as the frontal area. And the temporal area can be uh, shortened by the T. Uh, parietal area is P. And the occipital area is O. And the central area is uh, C. So there are many uh, different technique to, to record the EEG. We can use a cap, for example, like showing in this slide. We use a 64-channel cap to do the EEG recording. So there's a very important step to record the EEG. That's the preparation of the uh, cap or uh, the electrode in other techniques. The preparation, the purpose of the prep preparation of the cap is to reduce the impedance uh, of the electrodes. And in this slide, the red color means the very high impedance, and the uh, green color means low, uh, lower impedance, which we, we can use for uh, the next step for the recordings. So like in this slide, it's uh, a uh, new cap is named active cap. On the left side, uh, it's, uh, it's a cap before the, uh, uh, before the preparation. And we can see the technician is uh, using uh, the gel to prepare for the cap. And on the right side, almost all lights turns to green. That means uh, the cap is ready for the recording. And in the middle, uh, that means we are uh, doing the preparation. 
There's another technique named the electro, uh, electromyography, e EMG. Uh, this can also be used to record uh, the response to uh, TMS. And, and the uh, mechanism behind the EMG is, is the size principle. The size principle means um, there are many motor neurons in the spinal cord, and these neurons can be uh, recruited in order of from the smallest to the largest size when the muscle is doing a contraction and the contraction is increased little by little. So EMG with different techniques uh, can record the activity of muscle fibers. And the, the EMG recorded can reflect the excitability of neurons connecting to the muscle fibers. Uh, in this slide, uh, we show the recording of single motor unit. Here is a very important uh, concept named single motor unit. That means uh, single mo motor unit include uh, alpha motor neuron and all the uh, corresponding muscle fibers it innovated. That means all, all the fibers which connect to the uh, motor connect to the single motor unit has the same firing property. So when we use a needle to insert into the muscle and the tip of the needle is close to the muscle fibers we want to record, at that moment we can get the discharge of the muscle fibers. And this firing property of the muscle fiber uh, can reflect uh, the firing property of the motor neuron uh, which, it, uh, which is connected to all these muscle fibers. So on the right side we can see an uh, example recording uh, of the single motor unit recorded in, a, in the first dorsal interocerous muscle. So there is very clear limitation of single motor unit recording. Uh, at first, of course, uh, it's invasive and painful. And there's another important uh, limitation is that uh, it's almost impossible to record all the muscle fibers uh, in the muscle with a single motor unit recording. So over to overcome this uh, limitation, we can use the surface EMG. The C surface EMG is uh, used to monitor the general picture of the muscle activity. So the surface EM, EMG can superimpose uh, the activation potential of the muscle fibers under the electrode we use. So here we use an electrode attached on the surface of the muscle. So here's a concept named the compound muscle action potential, CMAP, CMAP. It's a very uh, useful measurement and it can be recorded with surface EMG. And the, the CMAP represents the summation of almost simultaneous action potential from many uh, muscle fibers in the same area. And usually C CMAP can be uh, can be evoked by stimulation of the motor nerve. So with this surface or the single motor unit recording, we can test the, the spinal cord activity. The next part I will talk about the test of spinal activity. So in the clinical neurophysiology, uh, a stimulation is often used to demonstrate whether the stimulated structure for example, brain, spinal cord, this structure is involved in, the, uh, in a special movement task. And we can analyze the response to the stimulation to look at the effect. So spinal activity can be tested by stimulation on the efferent pathway of spinal motor neuron. Uh, here we should say the basic uh, mechanism which underlying 
uh, this test is that the corticospinal neuron from the brain uh, in the motor cortex send their uh, very long axon down to the spinal cord and the synapse on these uh, spinal alpha, alpha motor neurons. And the alpha motor neurons send the uh, fibers which can synapse on the muscle fibers. And this is uh, uh, the physiological or and the anatomical uh, um, mechanism for testing the spinal cord activity. In this slide, uh, we introduce the monosynaptic reflex, uh, in, well, which is related to the spinal cord activity. Uh, the very classical uh, monosynaptic reflex is a stretch reflex. So we can see on, uh, in the picture when the doctor uh, tap the tendon of the muscle, the muscle spindle can be activated. And this will induce a monosynaptic reflex. And we call them uh, tendon reflex. On the right side is the, the pathway for the uh, tendon reflex. We can see the muscle spindle can be activated by the stimulation through a 1A efferent, it goes up to the alpha motor neuron. With the transfer in the alpha motor neuron, it goes down, it sends the uh, pulse to the muscle through the efferent nerve, which is the motor nerve. And in a physiological level, we can do a technique named the Hoffman reflex, H reflex. And the H reflex is the analog uh, to the tendon reflex. On the left side, uh, I show the uh, example recordings for the H reflex. I should mention here that when we do H reflex, at the same time, we can record the muscle wave, M wave. And this M wave is similar to the C map which I showed in the previous uh, slides. So in the recordings, from bottom to the top means the increase of intensity. At the very bottom, when we use very uh, low intensity, no response can be recorded. When we increase uh, the intensity, H reflex uh, appear at first. When the uh, the intensity was uh, increased ag again, uh, the H reflex become larger, and at the same time, M wave appears. And when the, uh, the intensity become very, uh, very high, uh, the H reflex becomes smaller and smaller, while the M wave become bigger and bigger. Uh, when the stimulus intensity reached a very high level, uh, H reflex disappeared, while M wave reaches uh, its maximum. So the maximum behind the, uh, this H reflex is that the stimulus uh, on uh, the stimulation, the electrical stimulation given to the nerve can go both the efferent, uh, the go to the efferent and the, the efferent fibers in both directions. So in, the, in this slide, I show the H reflex mechanism. On the left side is the uh, results, uh, the group analysis results for the uh, recordings shown in the, the previous figure. So x-axis means the stimulus intensity. Y-axis means the amplitude of H reflex, H reflex and the M wave. We can see that uh, the H reflex has a lower, fine, uh, lower threshold. And when the stimulus intensity increase, it reaches reach the maximum and then decrease with the, the increase of the stimulus intensity. On the other hand, uh, the M wave has 
uh, lower threshold, uh, has higher threshold, and it, it increase almost linearly with the, the increment of stimulus intensity, and finally reach the maximum. On the right side uh, is the mechanism behind the, the H reflex and M wave. We can see the red line means red error means uh, the stimulus uh, given to the motor nerve, and the blue arrow means stimulus uh, given to the uh, sensory nerve. With a single stimulation, uh, the, st uh, the impulse can go both way, the antidromic uh, way and the orthodromic way on both sensory and the, the motor nerve. So the uh, orthodromic uh, impulse on the motor pathway can uh, produce an M wave. And the antidromic pathway, uh, antidromic impulse on the sensory pathway can produce an H reflex. At the same time, uh, the antidromic impulse on the motor nerve can cancel the H reflex. That's why we can got the experiment uh, results, which I discussed previously. So with all these slides, we, we can know the H reflex is the analog to the stretch reflex in, in a physiological lab. And the H reflex uh, is often used to test the spinal activity in motor physiology. That means uh, if, uh, if we use a TMS to stimulate the brain and get a response in the muscle, uh, if the, we ask the subject to do two different tasks and we found the different response, at the same time, we, may, we must think about the uh, spinal cord activity as uh, the spinal cord is on the pathway of, from the motor cortex to the, um, to the muscle which we want to record. So there's a, a limitation for H reflex. That is, uh, the H reflex is sometimes very difficult to be recorded from a hand muscle. So as a replacement, we can do a F-wave experiment. The mechanism behind the F-wave is that when we use very, very high stimulus intensity, the H reflex can completely be blocked by the antidromic current, as we discussed before. At, the, at that time, no H reflex can be recorded. But at the same time, the antidromic current on the motor fibers uh, with this, we call it super maximum intensity. Such very high stimulus intensity can activate the motor neuron directly and they induce a wave. This is named F wave. So there's implication for F wave. We, we also can use, the, use F wave to test the spinal cord activity. So there's very clear limitation for F-wave is that uh, the, the F-wave only reflects the excitability of motor neuron with uh, very high firing threshold. There's a uh, immediate and a, a <coughs> very important uh, implication uh, for the F-wave recording. This is named the uh, central motor conduction time, CMCT. So when we give a stimulation to the cortex, uh, we can get a, a, we call the motor evoked tension, MEP, in the muscle. Uh, when we measure the uh, MEP, we can get the latency of this MEP. So the M MEP latency includes two parts. One is the central motor conduction time. Another is the peripheral uh, nerve conduction time. Let's go back to the previous study, use F-wave. 
when we give a, uh, electrical stimulation to the motor nerve, it goes up to the spinal cord and then goes uh, then come down to the muscle. Uh, this produces uh, latency. If we add this latency with the M wave latency, we can get two times of the peripheral nerve. So. Uh, uh, at this time, we should consider uh, a synaptic delay uh, on the transfer from the uh, motor nerve to the spinal cord, then come down to the muscle. So in the, form, uh, in the formula, we should uh, uh, subtract one synaptic de delay, which is one millisecond. So finally, uh, the formula comes up like the central conduction time uh, equals to the MEP latency minus F wave latency plus M wave latency minus 1 divided by 2. So the central conduction time can also be uh, measured with TMS alone. In this figure, we can see when we measure the conduction time uh, in in a hand muscle, APV muscle on the thumb, we can give a stimulation to C3, that's close to the motor cortex, uh, and it produces uh, uh, MEP. And at, if we give the stimulation uh, at the cervical level, it produces uh, MEP with shorter latency. Uh, if we get the difference between two uh, between two MEP uh, at a different site, we can get uh, finally get the central conduction, central motor conduction time. Uh, very similar technique can be used to measure the conduction time uh, in the leg muscle, tibialis anterior. Then we come to the next question. Uh, how can we do a motor cortical stimulation with TMS? This slide shows uh, the primary motor cortex. The primary motor, co motor cortex uh, is identified by Broadman Area 4. So the primary motor cortex contains a very large pyramid cell, which is a cortical spinal neuron. Uh, these neurons send very long axons down to the spinal cord and synapse with the spinal motor neuron pool. And importantly, primary motor cortex is a target for uh, many TMS studies. Uh, the physiological and the anatomical mechanism behind the TMS uh, targeting on motor cortex is showing in uh, is showing in this uh, slide. It's named the cortical homunculus. Uh, the cortical homunculus is, was found by a Canadian neuron neurosurgeon named Penfield, and Doctor Field used a needle uh, uh, used a needle stimulation uh, when he does the, the, uh, when he did the neurosurgeon, uh, and he stimulated the motor cortex and create the map, uh, which show in uh, this slide. So what we can see is that the presentations of different muscles in the in the primary motor cortex uh, are highly uh, disproportionate. Uh, and the, this is named the cortical homunculus. Uh, with this uh, mechanism, we, uh, that's why we uh, do many TMS studies. You use the uh, muscle, uh, we, we use the uh, very small hand muscles. As the small hand muscles uh, has a large uh, cortical presentation and can be easily recorded with surface EMG. This slide shows the equipment uh, 
for a TMS, for a TMS study. Uh, in a TMS lab, uh, there are several different uh, devices which should be uh, included. The first one, of course, is a stimulator of TMS. And this stimulator can be uh, connected to the, uh, a coil. And the coil delivers the, the stimulation to the brain. And with this stimulation, we can uh, record from the small hand muscle. For, either, for example, the first dorsal interosseous muscle, FDI muscle. Uh, for many studies, we use different combinations. For example, we do single pass. At that time, we only need one uh, stimulator. And sometimes we need two stimulators to, to do a pair pass protocol. At that time, we need a bi stim to connect two different uh, stimulators together. This bi stim was shown on the top in the, in the figure. And when we record uh, the muscle response, we should uh, use the amplifier as the, uh, the amplitude of the response is very small. The response was shown on the right side. It's named the motor evoked potential, MEP. So this slide shows the uh, electrical uh, mechanism of the transcranial magnetic stimulation. So when we give the stimulation, it, uh, the stimulation produces a very large but brief current uh, in the wire coil. And this uh, brief but large current was uh, produced by a discharging uh, of a bank of the capacities, which can be seen in the previous uh, slide. After uh, when we give the stimulation uh, to the brain, uh, there's a secondary induced current in the brain. The current uh, induced in the brain has the opposite direction to the, uh, to the current in the coil. Here we uh, should mention that uh, in the figure, this, uh, the magnetic field is produced by a round coil. There are many different coils uh, with different shapes. And the round, round coil is not, now not well used in many, many studies. So this slide shows the uh, magnetic coil with different shapes. Uh, the first A coil uh, is, is the same one uh, showing in the, in the previous slide. Uh, uh, it has a weak, uh, stim it produces a weak stimulation, which can See, we can see the uh, electrical field on the right side. Then there's an uh, idea to improve the uh, coil shape with different purpose. B coil and the C coil focus on, on the tip. The, uh, the electrical field focus on the tip of the uh, coil. And the D coil has uh, uh, a large coil with uh, high stimulus intensity. And the E-coil is small in size, which produces a focal stimulation. Uh, and the many studies use uh, the figure of eight coil, the F1. The figure of eight coil uh, used two coils, which uh, produce uh, the uh, current with the same direction at the uh, joint point of two coils. So that means at the center of the eight of eight, uh, figure of eight coil, the electrical field is the strongest. The figure of eight coil is now uh, well used and most used in many TMS studies. This slide shows the uh, example recording with a single stimulation uh, 
to a single site, but, but with recording in different muscles. On the top is the electrical stimulation, and the bottom is the magnetic stimulation. In the early years, uh, electrical stimulation was used to stimulate the brain. So the dis disadvantage for the electrical stimulation is that uh, when the current goes through the scalp, it activates the pain receptor uh, in the scalp. And uh, that's why the, the, electr uh, the electrical stimulation is very painful. And that's why electrical stimulation cannot be widely used. And later, people develop the magnetic stimulation. In this figure, uh, we can focus on the uh, motor evoked potential latency. What we can see is that with the stimulation, with a single stimulation, uh, the, the MEP latency is the shortest in the biceps muscle, and it becomes longer in uh, thalamus. Uh, in, in thumb, which is recorded in APB muscle, and it's longest in the leg muscle tibialis anterior. The uh, latency become longer and longer from the upper limb to the lower limb is consistent with the anatomic uh, findings, anatomical location of different muscles. The second uh, evidence which can be found in the figure is that the magnetic stimulation uh, produce MEP with slightly longer latency than the electrical stimulation, which we will discuss later. And this slide shows the stimulation with different, uh, at different locations, uh, but recording in different uh, in the same muscle. Uh, the recording was uh, made in the APV muscle. The top one. Uh, show the recording in right hand, and the bottom one show recording in, in left hand. Uh, what we can see is that uh, the, the first trial on the very top is uh, this uh, recording from electrical stimulation at the wrist, uh, which is similar to the M wave we discussed before. The second trial is the recording uh, from TMS at the cervical level, it produced a little longer latency than the M wave. And the, the third line uh, shows the MEP uh, with TMS at the cortical level. Uh, it produced the longest uh, MEP latency in three trials. This is also consistent with uh, the anatomic locations uh, of different stimulation. Here we discuss the site of stimulation. The bottom one is the electrical stimulation to the motor cortex. Here, cathodo electrode uh, is located in, in the center of the uh, scalp. We call it a vertex. And the, the anodal stimulation is located uh, in the motor cortex, close to C3, C4. So uh, the current produced by this electrical stimulation is a vertical uh, current. It goes down from the surface of the cortex to the uh, very deep area at, in, layer, in layer 5, 6, where the uh, large cortical spinal neuron are located. Uh, it is a little different for the uh, magnetic stimulation on the top. The magnetic stimulation, uh, which we discussed uh, previously, uh, is parallel to the surface of the cortex. So the stimulation only goes to, uh, only goes to the uh, interneurons in the uh, layer two and the layer three, and with both stimulation, uh, 
the stimulation uh, with both stimulation of the electrical stimulation and uh, uh, the magnetic stimulation. Uh, the stimulation is given to the uh, primary mo motor cortex on which can seen from the right slide. The primary mo motor cortex is located at the anterior bank of the central gyrus, a central sulcus. So we discussed that the uh, magnetic stimulation and the electrical stimulation are different, as the magnetic stimulation is a parallel to the uh, motor cortex, uh, which activates the P, uh, the layer two and the layer three neurons in the motor cortex, and the, uh, the electrical stimulation can activate the pyramid cells. Uh, located in the layer th 5 and layer 6. This leads to a very important concept in TMS, which is the D and the I waves. D wave, which is a direct wave, it shows a direct activation of the pyramidal neurons. And <coughs> I wave uh, is an indirect wave. The so indirect wave uh, reflect the indirect activation of the corticospinal neuron through the synaptic mechanism. In this figure, uh, we show the, uh, the corticospinal wave, the descending wave recordings uh, with the implanted spinal cord electrode. On the right side is an X-ray photo for the uh, electrode. We can see the electrode, uh, the spinal electrode was uh, implanted at, at the cervical level. There are four contacts, uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, uh, on the electrode. When we give a stimulation to the motor cortex, uh, the impulse go down to the spinal cord. Then we can uh, record a, a very tiny uh, potential named the descending wave from contact 0 and 3. These recordings are shown uh, on the left side. And the, on the middle is uh, uh, the MEP recording with uh, EMG electrodes. Uh, there's a red line in each, uh, in, uh, each uh, recording figure. For the corticospinal wave, recording. The, the red line means the D wave latency. And uh, on the right side, uh, for the MEP recording, uh, the red line means the T, uh, the electrical stimulation uh, induced the T, uh, MEP latency. Uh, there are different panels. On the top panel is uh, the recording for electrical stimulation. What we can see is that now, with the electrical stimulation, it produces a D wave. And the second line is uh, uh, the TMS with a lateral medial current. With this current direction, we also can produce D wave. But following this D wave, there's uh, the indirect wave, I waves. The, th uh, the bottom electrodes are uh, the, the recordings with the posterior anterior TMS uh, stimulation. With this direct current stimulation, we can see there's no D wave can be recorded. Uh, the first wave appeared as the I wave, I1 wave. Then there's a series of different waves. We name it I1, I2, I3. So from this recording, we can get uh, uh, information that the lateral medial direct current first generate D wave, and the posterior anterior current uh, generate I1 wave, and, uh, and the more waves can be generated when stimulus intensity increases. So different waves can also be uh, uh, recorded 
with uh, current, uh, with, with TMS with different currents. Uh, in this figure, at the top uh, is uh, the recording for TMS with lateral medial current. Uh, as we already discussed, a D wave can be uh, act, uh, generated, followed by later I1, I2, I3 waves. And the, in the middle is the, the stimulation with the, the posterior anterior current, which can be uh, which can be seen in most most TMS studies. With this current direction, uh, no D wave can be recorded. Uh, only I1 wave can be recorded with low intensity by uh, in increment in stimulus. So in stimulus intensity produce more waves, including I2 and I3 waves. And at the bottom, uh, the anterior posterior current uh, initially produce I3 wave with low stimulus intensity. And with the in increment in stimulus intensity, more waves, including I1 wave, can be seen. And this slide shows the uh, recording with single motor unit. Uh, the, the experiment was also done for recorded different waves uh, with different stimulus uh, current. Uh, on the, the recording on the left side is the MEP recording. And there's a dash line showing the latency with uh, LM current direction. Uh, on the right side uh, is uh, the single motor unit recording uh, with an analysis named, named uh, peristimulus time histogram, PSTH analysis. So on the top uh, of each panel is the recording with posterior anterior current. What we can see is that uh, the MEP latency is slightly longer than L uh, with slightly than the dash line, which showing the uh, MEP latency with lateral medial current. And with a single motor unit recording, we can see there are three different uh, waves can be recorded. I one. I2 and I3 waves. Uh, on the other side, uh, the anterior posterior current, which is shown in the bottom, with this current, MEP latency is longer than the posterior anterior current. And with the, the uh, single motor unit recording, we can see that uh, only I, later I waves including I3 wave and I4 waves uh, were recorded. This slide show an uh, animal study uh, uh, which discusses the, the mechanism of uh, later I waves. On the left side is the stimulation to the motor cortex. And uh, the recording is also the uh, spinal cord recording uh, uh, in a monkey. With the motor cortical stimulation, we can see uh, a series of I waves can be recorded. At the bottom, with uh, uh, a stimulation to the premotor cortex, uh, no I waves can be recorded uh, except for the stimulation with very high intensity. So on the right side, showing the uh, two stimulation was gi uh, were given along, uh, were given together. What we can see is that uh, when we give premotor stimulation with the motor cortical stimulation, the later I waves uh, were facilitated large, uh, were largely facilitated in both monkeys CS14 and the CS17. That means uh, the premotor cortex 
uh, is not directly producing the later I waves, but it's involved in the production of later I waves. This figure shows the uh, leading hypothesis in the field, which can explain the uh, production of cortical spinal waves. With a single stimulation of TMS, uh, many neurons can be activated in the primary motor cortex. These neurons include uh, the large cortical spinal neurons uh, in, in layer 5. We call, call them P5. Uh, at the same time, uh, the facilitatory interneurons in layer, layer 2 and layer 3, we call them P2, P3, can be activated. Also, there's inhibitory interneuron in the motor cortex. Some of them are uh, mediated by GABA transmitter, which is shown in the, the uh, black square. So with a single stimulation, all these neurons can be activated. The activation of the exon of P5 can produce the D wave. Uh, and the activation of the P2 and the P3 neuron can produce the I1 wave. So when the stimulation activates the GABA neurons, uh, it can eliminate the, the activation of I1 wave. This uh, is uh, uh, the inhibitory phase of the I1 wave uh, after the uh, the activation of I1 wave. So when the P2 and the P3 uh, is activated again uh, and the GABA neuron uh, stop firing, it, the later I waves are produced. Uh, when we use a different current direction, for example, the anterior posterior current direction, uh, we, we may uh, activate the, all these neurons and the these, all these neurons can be uh, influenced by the in inputs from the premotor cortex. And this is shown in, in the large circle around the, all these areas. So this f figure shows the, the leading hypothesis in the field, but there are many other uh, models which can uh, explain the uh, the mechanism behind the uh, very complex corticospinal uh, descending volley. And all these models and the hypothesis should be uh, tested in, in further experiments. So let's move to the, uh, the fourth part of the talk. Uh, TMS can also be uh, applied to different cortical areas uh, outside of the motor cortex. Uh, this one uh, showing an uh, important TMS technique named the TMS mapping. Uh, the coil of uh, the TMS coil is moved uh, in different di direction. Uh, on the x-axis is moved from the medial to lateral side, and the y-axis showing uh, the coil moving from the posterior to the anterior lo locations. Uh, at the center of this figure, uh, showing uh, the location which produces the, the largest MEP amplitude, we call it center of gravity. And when uh, TMS coil is moving around this uh, around this uh, point of center of gravity. Uh, TMS, uh, the MEP size becomes smaller, and finally we can get a uh, MEP map uh, from this technique. This technique has many different, but very important uh, implication. For example. Uh, in the patient with amputation, uh, the recording uh, on the intact side was shown on the left, and uh, uh, the amputated 
uh, side was shown on the right side. And the recording was made from biceps and the biceps muscle. And then the patient uh, has the uplink uh, amputation, but the, the, the biceps muscle is remained. What we can see is that uh, the amputated side has a much larger uh, activation area uh, than the intact side, which reflecting the more activated uh, state after the amputation. Uh, the MEP mapping technique can also be uh, used for the uh, motor learning experiment. In this experiment, uh, the, the subject do a serial serial uh, reaction time task. Uh, that means uh, the people, the subject use four fingers uh, from the index, uh, middle finger, ring finger to the uh, small finger, the little finger, uh, which represent one, two, three, four. And uh, the subject was asked to do a, a, a serial reaction time task with different sequence, uh, which can be shown on the screen. And this did a fairly long time to, uh, to learn for the subject. And uh, the learning of the, uh, the course can be recorded. And the performance during the learning will show on the right side. We can see both uh, the reaction time and uh, the performance become better uh, after many, many blocks. On the left side uh, is the brain mapping, the, uh, the MEP mapping for each different block. Uh, we can see before the uh, training, the stimulation uh, didn't cause any activation of the corresponding muscles. But with the stimulation, uh, with, uh, when uh, the training course is going on, uh, the activation of the uh, involved muscle become uh, larger and larger. And finally, uh, at the block nine, uh, the, the TMS map becomes the largest. So. Uh, that means the cortical areas for muscle involved in the task uh, increased after the motor learning uh, process. TMS can also uh, be given to uh, other different cortical areas uh, as the, there's a very complex uh, cortical networks in the brain. And the TMS can be used to test the connectivity between different cortical areas. Uh, in this figure, uh, we use uh, the, the uh, electroencephalography, the EEG, to record uh, uh, the effect of TMS. And if we analyze the, the, the different response, uh, the different component and the uh, the different location for the uh, TMS induced effect, we can know uh, TMS at one site can activate the uh, which area and which component. TMS can also be given to uh, a different cortical area. Uh, in this figure, we show the uh, electro, uh, show the recording with electroencephalography after uh, TMS on one side. And uh, with the analysis uh, with different components and at different location, we can know uh, the TMS on one side can activate the remote, uh, remote cortical areas. But with EEG recording, uh, there's a, 
uh, important uh, limitation to uh, do the experiment. That is, uh, the TMS evoked the potential, we call it TEP. The TEP uh, may be technically difficult for the very large artifact produced by TMS. Uh, so one way to, to um, overcome this uh, problem is to select the, the uh, TMS-compatible uh, caps uh, in the experiment. We can also use different software to remove uh, the TMS artifact with uh, such kind of experiment. But with all these efforts, uh, the art TMS artifact is still a very uh, big problem in the area of the TMS evoked potential. The TMS can also be uh, given to uh, uh, the non-motor cortical areas. Uh, sometimes this can lead to very high uh, impact studies. For example, in this uh, nature experiment, uh, TMS was given to different cortical areas. On the left side, we can see uh, the experimental setup. Uh, in this experiment, uh, the authors compare the effect of TMS uh, in the very early blind subjects to the healthy controls. So all the subjects perform uh, a, braille, a braille reading task, which show in the left, on the left side. Uh, at the beginning of the task, uh, the subject moves their index finger to start the, uh, the braille reading task. When the finger moves to the uh, left side, we can see uh, there's a laser beam on that. When the finger covers the laser beam, uh, it triggers uh, a TMS tray with three, three seconds uh, at, at, at about 10 hertz. With this uh, train of stimulation, uh, it produces uh, uh, virtual lesion in the stimulated area. The results are on the right side. Mm -hmm. For this uh, stimulate, uh, braid reading task, the subject uh, should uh, read out uh, what the characters they, they have read, read during the stimulation. And what was measured is uh, the uh, <coughs> the error of the reading task. Uh, the interesting thing is that uh, in the healthy control subject, uh, the stimulation on the uh, sensory motor cortex uh, produced a lot of error in the subject. This is because uh, the sensory inputs uh, was impaired by, by the train of stimulation. Another very important uh, result uh, is that in the blind subject, the sensory motor stimulation did not impair the results. But the middle occipital stimulation, was, which is targeted on the primary visual cortex, okay. impaired the uh, uh, impair the task and uh, impair the performance of the subject a lot. So the results uh, <coughs> suggest that the visual cortex is involved in, in the cognitive task in the uh, early blind subjects. Uh, this is uh, the, uh, the follow-up study for the previous one. In this uh, experiment, uh, uh, the, the stimulation, uh, the setup was uh, changed a little bit. The motor task is that the subject uh, was given, was present uh, 
a word with the auditory uh, stimulation. For example, in this subject, the apple, the word apple was presented to the subject. And with this uh, uh, auditory stimulation, the subject should respond a logically uh, correct word. For example, eat. But the subject cannot uh, respond like a drink or other words. At the same time, a train of stimulation uh, at 10 Hz lasted for three seconds was given to uh, different cortical areas. These areas including the visual cortex, uh, the prefrontal cortex, the sens somatosensory cortex, and the, uh, the lateral occipital cortex. The interesting thing is that uh, in the sight control, in the healthy control, the prefrontal cortex stimulation uh, impairs the performance of the subject. That means uh, in healthy control, the prefrontal cortex is, uh, uh, is important for the cognitive task. But the, the results is different in the, the subject who is early blind. The only uh, visual, cortic visual cortical stimulation uh, produce the impairment of the motor performance. So all these experiments showed that uh, the stimulation, the TMS stimulation to different cortical areas can be uh, important for the uh, for, for the cognitive and the motor learning tasks. Going to the summary of <coughs> this lecture, at first, TMS is a powerful neurophysiological technique to study human brain functions. Uh, the effect of TMS can be recorded with electroencephalography and the electromyography. Spinal activity should be taken into consideration for a TMS study. Motor cortical stimulation activates the cortical spinal neurons and produces descending cortical spinal waves. Uh, the effect of TMS at other cortical areas are often complex and may interfere with motor learning and the cognitive process. So again, uh, I am Dr. Zenni. I'm working in the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and the Stroke. Uh, I'm a senior research fellow. Uh, thank you very much for watching this video. I hope this video can help you uh, when you do TMS studies. Thank you very much.